I was in the U.S. Navy in the CBs, which is short for construction battalions. And my expertise was blasting, taking out mountains and turn them into gravel pits. Pretty interesting, good stuff. I finished my contract, got out honorably, thank goodness, and, uh, and just went from there. And learned a great trade, came out, was a very successful businessman, three businesses later, been a millionaire twice. The MS hit me and everything went. The majority of patients that I work with that have MS tell me that fatigue is one of the biggest limiting factors, that it impacts their life more than any other aspect of MS. Right around one, two o'clock in the afternoon, um, I start running out of energy. It can be so severe that I, I won't have energy to get off the couch to go just make dinner. People with MS-related fatigue might describe that fatigue as being like having a a heavy weight on them, that it's just, it's hard to move, it's hard to get out of bed. It's like walking around with no blood in your body. If, I don't know if you can relate to that, I probably can't because you're not a zombie, but I, you know, that's what it feels like. Fatigue is perhaps one of the most significant symptoms that people living with multiple sclerosis can have. It can really impact a variety of aspects of their life, impact their ability to work, participate with their family. I used to run a business and raise my kids by myself and uh, take them to school and make sure I was there to pick them up and all that stuff. I was raising like Natalie by myself there for a while and then I realized that, you know, I'm no longer capable of attending to her needs. But that was a sacrifice, a big time sacrifice. When someone with MS comes in complaining of fatigue, I like to get a sense of what's the source of the fatigue, so because that can help us figure out what intervention might be most helpful. So morning time is best for you. Yes. And does that impact how you plan your day? Absolutely. It can be directly from their MS, and it can be related to something not their MS, just like a regular person in the population might have a sleep abnormality, a thyroid problem, vitamin deficiency, Somebody with multiple sclerosis could have that as well. We want to make sure that we rule out medical problems that have easy and good treatments. We want to make sure that we have evaluated their psychological state and we don't miss that as a source of fatigue. We want to review their medications and make sure we don't have a medication that's making their fatigue worse or causing it. There are some medications that can be helpful for people living with multiple sclerosis who are experiencing fatigue. There's three main ones that we go to, amantadine, modafinil, and methylphenidate. I used to try drinking a Red Bull and stuff to extend my day because I had things to do. No help. I've taken other medications, methylphenidate and stuff, and those, I didn't really like taking those because it was messing with my head, you know. Two months ago, they worked. This month, they don't. There's definitely treatments other than medications for fatigue. Um, one of them is exercise. We do want to make sure that exercise is a big part of their, their daily activity, just so that they can maintain their strength, because then they'll get fatigued a little bit less. We also know that different kinds of psychological treatment, such as something called cognitive behavioral therapy, can be very effective for treating fatigue. We want to take a look at what are the thoughts coming up and what emotions are coming up around that and if there's unhelpful thoughts we can start to challenge those unhelpful thoughts. I had no idea that um, until you showed me this stuff that I, I there was an actual action I could take to rearrange my thinking yeah. instead of going dark. There's ways you can change your thinking which I didn't know. Like if you wake up in a positive attitude you might go on positive through the day. We know that people with multiple sclerosis who experience increased heat can then experience fatigue. Pat and I have worked on several different approaches for fatigue management. A big one was cooling equipment. So he has a cooling vest, a cooling hat, some other cooling equipment that he uses, an air conditioner in his home. I live in a controlled environment. I have an air conditioner that was given to me by the VA. And if you'll notice on the wall behind me, I've got that big thermometer hanging there. It's gaudy as heck, but it's a very useful tool. 
I'm a 71 degree guy, you know, having learned through trial and error how much heat I can take in a day without losing my energy. One of the things that we can do to help with fatigue is to get a good night's sleep. Working on sleep hygiene is kind of a hot topic right now. That would be things like going to bed at the same time every night, waking up at the same time every morning, sleeping in a cool, dark space, making sure that it's a quiet space, that kind of thing. Occupational therapy is very important in helping people manage fatigue. We're looking at the activities that they do, and if there are ways that we can modify them to help them conserve energy or do them more efficiently. Say, cooking in the kitchen. We might recommend that somebody sits while they're cooking. And so what do you think as far as where those are located for energy? Well, I'm pretty tall, so I, I use my cup. Absolutely. Cabinetry. Really thinking about how things yeah. are being done to, to be more efficient. OT gets you adaptive things. Like, for instance, I like cooking. And one time I told Denise that I would walk around in the kitchen and I'm looking around, there's blood on the floor and stuff. And I didn't realize because my numb arm, I'd cut my hand. So she got me an adaptive glove, a culinary glove that you can't cut through or nothing, which I use now. I saved my fingers. That's why I was telling Denise, look, I got all my fingers still, you know. Mr. Stipkovich is able to walk short distances and normally uses a cane, but if he wants to do something where the walking distance is longer, he would not be able to do it just walking. So he has a scooter, and it's a great example of using a tool to sort of extend his energy, extend the amount of things that he can do so that he can participate in life, either grocery shopping or going on activities with his family. Sometimes a person living with multiple sclerosis will come to a point where they realize they cannot increase the amount of energy and activity they can do just by exercising or pushing themselves harder. At that point, it's important for them to consider what it is in life that is most important for them, what they really want to have happen during the day. I do prioritize different activities during the day according to their value and necessity something that he really wants to do. He'll come up with a way to pace himself or a strategy to help him to get there. And at the same time, sometimes he says no to things. You know, I bring my scooter out here and I fish right here off this pier. You do? Have you caught anything? Um, no. No. <laughs> hey, but to be honest. It's necessary to be successful in the day to monitor and meter the amount of activity you have within those specific hours of your abilities. And I usually don't get them all done. You know, so I don't get disheartened about it. They usually fix themselves. Honey, you're getting as tall as I am. I know. <laughs> you gotta quit growing like that, you're my baby. I know, seriously. <laughs> How's everything going? Um, I do have an issue with, um, with uh, energy. Mm -hmm. I think the most important thing about fatigue and multiple sclerosis is that patients remember how important it is to bring it up with their providers, not just their physician, but also the physical therapist, the occupational therapist, the nurse. Bring it up, let people know, because there's a variety of strategies. People should not have to suffer at home from fatigue when there's a lot of good strategies to use. The negative symptoms that we have associated with MS are manipulatable. There are little secrets and little tweaks that you can learn through your physicians, especially at the VA hospital in Seattle. I mean, they've got more moves than a Swiss watch. In my job dealing with people with multiple sclerosis, I'm always amazed at the strength that I see. These people are living with uncertainty. They're living with symptoms sometimes that other people don't see, other people don't see their fatigue. And yet I'm amazed with their strength, their will to go on, their drive, their focus. I think the bravery that comes with living with MS is quite astounding. I've gotten so much help in regards to that and advice from the VA and stuff, which is, I mean, I would be a basket case like I was when I first came around to VA. And they've helped me sustain my standard of living to the extent that I've got some hope and I'll go forward instead of just giving up. We used to do a lot of fishing, didn't we? Yeah, we did. It was our deal. We are invested and we do care. And I think that he sees that and he feels that. and. I think we all see ourselves as advocates for him. Yeah. I enjoy working with him, and I know his other providers do too. It's very touching to get to be a part of the journey and to be here witnessing their strength, being sort of a standby assistance. 
hoping that I glean some of their strengths for times when my life may not be going well. Seek out the answers, because they're there. Don't give up and throw the towel in before the miracle, you know, because there's good meds coming, and there's great professional help we can get for this disease. So we don't have to ever do it alone. Aww, That's your niece. So and yeah. It's odd because... She's my niece, and she's what, 22? Yeah, she's 22 now. And I'm 60. <laughs> and I'm her aunt. <laughs> she better be.